everyone, and welcome to the Addiction Recovery Channel. I'm Ed Baker, and I'm your host producer. Today, uh, we have a treat in store. We're very fortunate indeed to have Dr. Richard Rawson with us for the show. Thank you, Dr. Rawson, for being with us. Thanks for inviting me. Yes. Just a little bit about uh, Dr. Rawson before we begin. Rick is an Emeritus Professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Biobehavioral Science at UCLA School of Medicine. He's also a research professor at the University of Vermont. Dr. Rawson has conducted an extensive portfolio of research on methamphetamine, which we'll be talking about today. Methamphetamine is one of the drugs that is uh, increasingly being used in America and in Vermont and increasingly uh, causing uh, death. Uh, Rick has been involved in projects on behavioral and medication treatments for methamphetamine. He also was a member of the Federal Methamphetamine Advisory Group for Attorney General Janet Reno. During the past decade, Dr. Rawson has worked with the National Institute of Drug Use the Substance Use and Mental Health Sub, uh, Services Administration, the U.S. De uh, State Department, the World Health Organization, and the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime. He's worked on international substance use research and training projects, exporting U.S. technology and addiction science throughout the world. Dr. Russin has published three books, 40 chapters in other books, and over 240 professional papers. Thank you, Dr. Rawson, uh, for taking the time out of what looks to be a, a, a brutal schedule uh, to join us today. We appreciate you being here. You're welcome. You know, um, I'd like to just set the context for the show a little bit by speaking about the, the history of, of, of substance use um, lethality in, in America and in Vermont. It, it, I remain alarmed uh, by this, and um, I just want to I want to share that alarm a little bit. Historically, in um, 2015, the Drug Enforcement Administration, in their National Drug Threat Assessment, noted 700 deaths attributable to fentanyl between late 2013 and late 2014. So 700 fentanyl-related uh, deaths. <clears throat> As of April 2021, for the 12-month period ending April 2021, there have been 68,000 deaths um, directly attributable to fentanyl. So from 700 in late 2013 to late 2014 to 68,000 uh, a mere six or seven years later. This to me is in incredibly uh, shocking and uh, alarming. Current reports in America cite fentanyl as being the number one cause of death for Americans aged 18 through 45. Rick, let's start with that. Let's start uh, with a discussion of the national trend historically and what exactly is happening? What is happening? Well, the, the United States has, has always had these cycles of uh, illicit drug use. Um, generally, they've cycled between periods of high rates of stimulant use, and then followed by high rates of opioid use, and then back to stimulant use. Um, we saw that in the 90s, in the early 2000s, when we had uh, high rates of methamphetamine and cocaine use. But then beginning in the mid first decade of the 2000s, we started to see the onset of the current opioid crisis, mm -hmm. starting with prescription opioids, which certainly here in Vermont, we saw uh, in very high amounts, um, painkillers that were being prescribed and diverted, uh, switching over to heroin that uh, occurred during the like 2013, 14, 15, and then recently uh, fentanyl. Now, when I was doing my, my work in one of the other phases of my career in California, I was uh, running uh, clinics that provided methadone treatment. 
I remember one time we had a police report in the community that there was a pharmacy burglary and fentanyl was now out on the street. This was considered a major public health crisis in Los Angeles County that, that this one source of fentanyl had made it onto the street because the perception of fentanyl at that time and now is that it's so deadly that, mm. that the idea that it would become mainstreamed as a routine drug on the street was unthinkable. I mean, it was, it was really like, oh my God, fentanyl is on the street. We need to uh, get all this public knowledge out into the community and tell all the patients. And uh, mm. now fentanyl is, is everywhere. It's not only sold as fentanyl in powder form in very small amounts, it's only a tiny amount that it takes to be fatal, to produce a fatal overdose. It's actually the cartels in, in Mexico have determined that this is a product that they want to use as a uh, as their central product. Uh, now they uh, stamp it into tablets. Some of it's being sold as Oxycontin. Some of it's being sold as Xanax. Uh, it's now in most of the stimulants being sold. Most of the cocaine and methamphetamine include fentanyl. It's everywhere. It's, uh, I had a, a discussion this morning with a group, mm. talked about it, it's sort of like sugar, it's just sort of mixed in with everything. Mm. And uh, that's been a really big change in our landscape of uh, uh, drug, drug, mis drug misuse and drug addiction in that never before have we had a drug this lethal, mm. that's this widely available and has been used everywhere. And that's why <clears throat> these, overdose death rates have gone through the roof in the last several years. Incredible. It's incredible to me. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, um, fentanyl is measured in what's called uh, micrograms as opposed to milligrams. Right. Most opioids are measured in, 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 in units of milligram, which is a thousandth of a gram. A microgram is a millionth of a gram. Right. So that's uh, a measure of the lethality of this particular drug. And I mean, that's that's fine when a pharmaceutical company is doing the, you know, the, 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 the production. But when it's an international crime organization mixing a drug with that kind of lethality, you have what we what we have on the on the streets today. And um, <clears throat> your story about California a number of years ago and the alarm in the community. I, I just think that's so appropriate that there should be alarm at that level in the community. And it seems to me today that uh, our, our, our culture is becoming desensitized to these incredible numbers. It's almost like it's so painful. We can't, we can't look at it. Some, some statistics have 103,000 deaths uh, in the 12 month period ending April. 2021, and there's really no reason to think that the velocity is going to um, to slow down. You know, I know you're you're a Vermonter, and I, and I know you have a love for for the state and the people in the state, and you've been looking closely at Vermont. So let's uh, let's take a, a look at uh, Vermont. The numbers uh, that I have here are in 2010, uh, there were 41 deaths statewide. Uh, attributable to opioid overdose. In 2021, there were 169 deaths attributable to opioid overdose, clearly a 400% increase in deaths in Vermont. 2021 is on record to be the worst year ever. As of the end of October, there are 169 deaths, so we've already surpassed 2020 with two months to go. If, if my calculations are correct, and it doesn't take really much to calculate this fairly accurately, it, it looks like as of the end of 2021, we will have lost a little over 200 fellow Vermonters to opioid overdose. So <clears throat> this is a 500% increase uh, since 2010. The worst year in Vermont history. What? What have yeah, you? Yeah. One of 
Well, yeah. One of one of the one of the details in in the middle of that, Ed, that's really so discouraging uh, is that from 2012 or whatever your starting number was, um, we saw this steep increase in overdose deaths, 2012, 2013, 14, 15, 16. It was almost a, a, a 45 degree angle that was going up. But then Vermont's work in uh, producing the hub and spoke treatment system and getting medication assisted treatment widely accepted in the state of Vermont and widely available in the state of Vermont, actually leveled off 2017, 2018, we started to see a decrease. It, we sort of, it hit the top and it was coming down. And that was clearly the result of all the work that's been done to get medication treatment available to people. And there was really a sense of optimism that maybe we've seen the worst of this crisis because now we've got so much treatment in the community. And then came fentanyl. Yeah. And fentanyl has driven those numbers. Uh, as you said, I think 2018 or 2019, it was just over 100 people who died of overdose. And yeah. now this year, it's going to likely be double that. Yeah. So it's, um, it's remarkable what this, uh, this one drug has done to the, to the current environment in Vermont. Yeah, incredible, and the velocity of it is is so over overwhelming. And you know, Rick, the more I look at it, and the more I read about it and study it, and um, like like you, you know, pr pretty much full time or double time, you know, it, it, this is not a a, 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 an, a user driven phenomenon. It's not like people who unfortunately have severe opioid use disorder are saying, you know, we want fentanyl. It's more of a supply side driven phenomenon where people have no choice. They're exposed to a contaminated drug supply. They're at the mercy of uh, international uh, criminal organizations. And as a result, they're dying at an unprecedented rate. It is, it is in fact, in my view, the, the most vulnerable population at the mercy of, of, of ruthless, ruthless uh, predators. And like, like you say, we, we have done in Vermont, the response in Vermont has been mighty. You know, you know better than I, how, you know, we're, we're, we, people admire us all through America. When they look at the system in Vermont, they say, wow, Vermont is great. They're really responding with compassion, science to this population. <laughs> Our response is mighty, but even, even with the, the magnitude of our response, it just seems to be overwhelming and out of, out of control. Is that the sense that you have? Yeah, and, and one point you made about people sort of wandering into the use of fentanyl without knowing what uh, they're getting themselves into. That's true, and that many of them were introduced without knowing they were taking a new drug. They either were buying heroin and it started to have fentanyl in it or buying cocaine and it started to have fentanyl in it. However, if they start taking it over time, then they actually do seek it out because their level of opioid dependence becomes so severe that they need the strong opioid effect of fentanyl to relieve their with or to prevent their withdrawal symptoms. So you actually convert them. I've, I've done some interviews with uh, people who are currently using in Vermont, and they said they won't buy a drug now unless it has fentanyl in it because they become tolerant and they need the extra potency of fentanyl. So it's, it's actually converted them into regular fentanyl users. I mean, they'll still use other drugs if, if for some reason fentanyl wasn't available, but it is now the drug of choice for many of the, the individuals. It wasn't at the beginning, but that switched over. So, so in other words, there's um, like a conditioning at the mu receptor, at the opioid receptor. Right. That makes the person more dependent on fentanyl than they would be, say, on morphine. That's so correct. Now they need yep. fentanyl to relieve uh, withdrawal symptoms. I, I also understand that the, the half-life uh, of fentanyl at the mu receptor. The activity in the brain is shorter acting 
than morphine. So the person needs to self-administer the drug more frequently. Is that true too? Yeah, that's true. Although there's an interesting paradox in that um, fentanyl appears to hang around the mu receptor for quite a while, not in high amounts, but in some amounts, which when people are uh, uh, admin administered buprenorphine for the first time, we're seeing more difficulty of people to get on buprenorphine hmm. because fentanyl will precipitate a withdrawal effect and it'll give, they'll get symptoms often in their first several doses. It really has caused a challenge for many of the uh, doctors who prescribe buprenorphine uh, because they'll start patients, they'll, they'll say to them, look, you need to abstain from opioid use for four to six hours before your first dose. And even if patients do that, they take their dose of buprenorphine and they get some withdrawal symptoms. And that's made induction of people onto buprenorphine more challenging. And it's, um, we're seeing in some places, I know my colleague who runs a treatment center in California said they're using more methadone now because methadone doesn't have that same problem. And that's a real shame. I mean, methadone is a great treatment, but buprenorphine is able to be used in a much wider array of settings and it's really a much more, makes the treatment more available. Um, so fentanyl is having all sorts of negative effects on our ability, on both on the death rate and on our ability to treat people. All the, all the more reason, and, and I understand that, the, uh, the buprenorphine product uh, containing uh, now, naltrexone will, would cause withdrawal, whereas right. methadone doesn't contain the uh, naltrexone. That's right. Product. Yeah, there's so no antagonist. Right. Well. It's almost like a like a, a perfect storm of variables that's working against public health in 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 a, in a huge way. You know, um, let's let's move now from from opioids because you you've mentioned it and I've mentioned it. The uh, this idea of stimulants and methamphetamine. Um, it's kind of like the three waves are prescription drugs, heroin, and now fentanyl. And now, lo and behold, in the middle of all this, we have yet a fourth wave, methamphetamine and cocaine. Let's talk a little bit about that, because I know you spent a lot of time looking at that, Rick. Yeah, well, as I said, historically, we've had this um, history of cycles. And obviously, we've just had a massive opioid well, we're still in the middle of a massive opioid uh, epidemic. And predictably, we're starting to see an upswing in, in stimulants that Nora Volkov, the director of NIDA, has referred to as the fourth wave. And, but this is going to be different because it's not going to be, we had a lot of opioids, now we're going to just have a lot of stimulants. We're going to have both. We're going to continue to see these mixtures of cocaine, methamphetamine, and fentanyl. Um, so we're really at a sea change in kind of how our drug epidemics have unfolded in the United States. But the, the important point is for individuals here in Vermont who have maybe historically used cocaine as a recreational drug or used it uh, on occasion, now they're getting a much more potent drug, methamphetamine, the availability of methamphetamine in Vermont for the first time has started to significantly increase. Uh, as you know, from the meetings we have monthly with the, uh, in Chittenden County, the police are reporting a lot more seizures of methamphetamine. They tend to be the people who see new drug trends first, mm -hmm. and that's what they're reporting. Our overdose data are starting to show methamphetamine in a higher proportion of the uh, overdose deaths. And so uh, when I talked with Dan Wolfson at the University of Vermont in the emergency department, he said they're seeing more people coming in with methamphetamine psychosis as well as methamphetamine related overdose. So this is a trend that we've seen when I was in California and still in California, methamphetamine is by far the biggest uh, illicit drug uh, problem. And Vermont has been kind of protected for, for whatever reason yeah. for, um, from that earlier epidemic, but it's finally made its way here. New Hampshire's seen very high rates of methamphetamine use 
and overdose related uh, deaths. Uh, Vermont is, seems to now be sort of the end of the pipeline for, for uh, this drug, but, but it actually is now making a, a major impact in Vermont. I do, I, yeah, I do remember uh, a number of years ago where there was this threat of methamphetamine traveling across the country to Vermont. We all got geared up for it. That's right. And it never happened. And it was great that it never happened. <clears throat> but it seems to be happening now, as you say. Uh, it looks like <clears throat> the West Coast was protected against fentanyl because of black tar heroin. It looks like <clears throat> fentanyl now is increasingly causing death on the West Coast, while metham methamphetamine is increasingly <clears throat> causing death on the East Coast. Uh, the numbers that I have from the um, Office of uh, Alcohol and, and, and Drug uh, Use Programs is from January to September 2020, there were seven overdoses, seven overdose deaths involving stimulants. From January to September 2021, there were 18. Right. So it's uh, almost a, a tripling uh, of overdose deaths involving uh, stimulants. <clears throat> now that's uh, that's uh, again uh, almost a 300 percent increase in in one year. I know that you know, and you've mentioned hub and spoke and buprenorphine, you know, and the, the and the the wonderful treatment that is available to people with a severe opioid use disorder. I know you've studied um, methamphetamine, and it's it's kind of a daunting, perplexing um, disease process. It it seems so difficult uh, to actually treat. I, I I think you've made some inroads recently with successful uh, treatments. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, and and when we're talking about methamphetamine, I mean, the, in parallel, the although the rates of cocaine use have not been going up the same way that they have with methamphetamine, cocaine use is still a significant public health issue, particularly in the African-American community and mm -hmm. urban centers in the United States. Methamphetamine is starting to encroach on that, but it would be a mistake to think cocaine has gone away and we don't have to worry about that. So both of these psychostimulants, cocaine mm -hmm. and methamphetamine, are a class of drugs that have a very different effect than opioids. They affect different parts of the brain than opioids. And the, the medications that we develop for treating people with opioid use disorder are not relevant to the treatment of people with stimulant use disorder. I started doing work in this area. The first paper I published was in 1981, where we were looking at a, a medication for the treatment of people with methamphetamine, and this was in Southern California, it didn't, and it didn't work. It didn't work any better than placebo. I then spent about 20 years of my career running medication trials for cocaine and methamphetamine um, medications. We tried all kinds of things. We tried antidepressants. We tried anti-seizure medicines. We tried uh, some antivirals that there was a reason to think might work. We, nothing has been uh, successful. There's a couple of things now that look a little bit promising, but they're nowhere near the sort of the robust effect of buprenorphine and methadone for opioid use disorder. So we're still really struggling to find the right molecules to produce a medicine to uh, help us with treating people with stimulant use disorder. Now that's, that's you know, a, 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 a challenge, but in 1991 here in, in Vermont, uh, Steve Higgins at the University of Vermont uh, published the first paper in treating people with cocaine use disorder using a technique called contingency management. Uh, Higgins, it was a breakthrough paper. I remember in California when I was, I was doing all kinds of behavioral treatment for people with cocaine use disorder. And I saw this paper from Higgins and I thought, there's got to be something wrong with this. This the, the, these rates of success are ridiculous. I know how tough it is to treat people with cocaine and methamphetamine, and he's getting this very high rate of success. Steve and the co his colleagues at UVM published and published and published and published all the same outcomes. The, all very robust, positive treatment. I should I should tell you that. Uh, about two years ago, I did some interviews uh, in Burlington with a bunch of 
uh, people who were current users of drugs. And several of them said, well, and there were some, a bunch of people who were now sober from, mm -hmm. and they had been users of drugs. And there were a, a quite a large number who had gotten sober in Steve Higgins' oh, wow. contingency management trials and were still in recovery. Um, this is a technique that involves the use of incentives um, for rewarding patients for reducing or stopping their drug use. Um, you have a schedule. Uh, people come in, they give urine samples. If they give a negative urine sample for stimulants, they can earn a $10 gift card or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And um, this technique, there's all sorts of variations on how much and how long and all of that. But there have now been in the last five years, uh, seven meta-analyses of the literature. Those, these are like where these researchers take all the studies in an area, pull them all together and draw out the common results. And when that's been done for the treatment of people with stimulant use disorder, both cocaine and methamphetamine, contingency management has by far the most robust uh, treatment effect. Um, now there's been some reasons why it hasn't been used. It's, it hasn't been, made its way into the real world treatment system yet. It stayed in the laboratory. Um, Higgins did his work and his colleagues, or I did some studies, a number of other people did. We all found the same thing. This, wow, this really works remarkably well. Um, but to get this paradigm shift where you're using incentives as a treatment, that takes a big change. It takes the government to change what you can use your funding for because these are, it's an expenditure and you have to get approvals through you know, Medicaid and all that. And that has not been forthcoming. It's been sort of stalled for about 15 years at this point. Wow. There's been a breakthrough though in the state of California right now, the state has decided to roll out a $58 million pilot project to provide treatment for people with cocaine and methamphetamine use disorder using contingency management. And that will, that's being viewed not only here in the US, my colleagues at, in the World Health Organization and the United Nations are monitoring it very closely because mm -hmm. around the world, the large parts of the world have big problems with methamphetamine and cocaine use disorder. And we literally have no other treatment that has anywhere close to this kind of an effect. And um, it's great that it's now being used. We had a meeting this morning with the new head of the Nash, Nash, Office of National Drug Control Policy. And it's a priority of the Biden administration to make contingency management an available treatment to provide a viable, effective treatment for people with stimulant use disorder. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, continued uh, focus, you and, and your colleagues. And it's, I'll tell you, it's great to hear the enthusiasm and the joy in your voice, you know, that, that, that we, we need, we need kind of hope about moving, moving forward. And this sounds like a, a very hopeful intervention. I read a little bit about it. And I also saw that along uh, that there's also like a, a component of an important component of exercise. And then what was called, I think, um, po like a, a positive involvement in an activity. Uh, it, it, can you speak to that? There was a few different components. Well, that's, those are, those are additional interventions that are sometimes used together with contingency management. Oh, okay. Contingency okay. management itself is purely the incentive, the incentive, <laughs> And, and there's a little bit of a, a story to it. It's, you know, if you, if you came into treatment and we had a contingency management program and you explained it to you and said, if you can give a, a drug, a stimulant negative urine, you can earn a $10 gift card. If you can give three negatives in a row, you'll earn a $15 gift card. If you, or if you give another three in a row, the increase goes to $17.50 per urine. So there's an escalating amount, which is intended to help people develop longer periods of abstinence. Mm -hmm. So you're reinforced for consecutive uh, uh, negative urines. Mm -hmm. And that, that is an important part of contingency management. But while people are on contingency management, their, their drug use is reduced, 
that's great, but they often need assistance in learning. Well, what do I do now? Yeah, yeah. If I've, uh, I'm no longer doing this behavior that took up 80% of my life, getting the money, buying yeah. the drugs, yeah. using the drugs, recovering from the drugs, getting more money. I mean, all of that becomes all encompassing to the individual who uses drugs. Um, so now what do I do with all this time? And so some of the available uh, therapies, things like the community reinforcement approach, mm -hmm. which by the way, was first applied to stimulant use disorder by Steve Higgins and his team wow. at the University of Vermont. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is used. Our work is involved, when I was at UCLA, we did some work on exercise and we got some very positive yes. benefits to both people's general health, to their recovery, to their brain recovery. And so we think that in addition to using contingency management, there are other things that are helpful to use with it. Well, I can't tell you, I'm excited by that and I'll look forward to further research on that for sure, Rick. You know, and, and again, um, it's hopeful and, and we need that. Let's, yeah, let's... just one, one, one point I want to make about that. Yeah. If you think about what we've done for treatment for people with addiction over the years, it started out with talk therapy of a variety of kind, whether it was Synanon doing mm -hmm. the game or whether it was, you know, 12 step recovery activity or whether it was cognitive behavioral therapy or motivational, it's all involved talk therapy. The other brand of the other sort of major theme of treatment has involved medication. First, well, we did some work with an abuse back in the 50s and 60s, but methadone came along in the 60s. Naltrexone came along in the 70s. Buprenorphine came along in the early 2000s. And so we've had this, these two tracks of treatment talk therapy and medication treatment. One of the challenges with contingency management is that it's neither of those. Mm -hmm. it, it involves the application of these contingencies of giving incentives in, in a systematic way. And I think we're, one of the challenges we have is people going, well, hold it, that's treatment. And, and in fact, it is treatment and it's by far the most robust treatment. And the enthusiasm you hear in, in my voice is very similar to the enthusiasm I had when I came back to Vermont 2015, and I went out and evaluated the hub and spoke system. It's like, wow, this is great. There's a lot of people benefiting from this who would be using heroin and now are you know, working and holding jobs yeah. and having yeah. families. Yeah. I've seen that same thing happen with contingency management with people with stimulant use disorder but it hasn't been widely used. That seems to be changing. And so I'm hopeful about that. That, that is great, again, and that, that's, that's great to hear. So let's, let's stick with this um, theme, like this, the treatment theme, that, 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 that and, and hopefully this will take effect in Vermont, contingency management. But let's, let's look at, uh, go, let's go back to opioids now and take a look at, there's been a mighty response in Vermont. I just jotted down um, some of the responses that come to mind immediately. So we have uh, uh, medications for opioid use disorder. We have the magnificent uh, hub and spoke, you know, program, uh, widely, a wide net over Vermont that's very, very successful. I think that there's no waiting list. The waiting list is zero. We have um, the recent uh, legislate, legislation that decriminalized the possession of small amounts of non-prescribed buprenorphine, very, very uh, progressive um, you know, move in Vermont. We, you know, we're, we're recognizing that people who may be possessing buprenorphine may be possessing it because they're trying to get off heroin, they're trying to you know, um, enable themselves to stop uh, using fentanyl. We have various harm reduction techniques. We have fentanyl test strips. We have a widespread distribution of naloxone to reverse overdoses. We have safe syringe programs. We have outreach. There's a lot, there's a mighty, mighty response. 
But in, in spite of, of our response, and I'd like you to, to, to elaborate on that a little bit, what, what, you have, what you think of our response. But in spite of that response, Rick, we have the numbers that you and I have both so cited earlier in the show. So I want to move, I want you to elaborate on that a little bit, but then I want to move into this next idea of overdose prevention sites and what okay. is keeping us from implementing this this next science-based um, unequivocal best practice when it comes to saving the lives of people with severe opioid use disorder. So speak to that for a, for a minute, please. Well, I think the um, fentanyl was a game changer. And fentanyl was um, the lethality of this drug and this rate of overdose death increase that's gone through the roof has has actually gotten policymakers to step back and go, hold it. We've always thought about our efforts in addiction treatment as being about the promotion of recovery, getting people sober, helping people get drugs out of their lives or, or you know, getting abstinence so they can have a drug-free life and, you know, develop the benefits of, of being sober. And that's really been our focus and almost our exclusive um, considerations. What do we need to do to help people to get sober? And that's important. And that's, that's been a, that's paid dividends and, and, has, and has made some help many people save, get their life saved. However, with fentanyl, we have to take a step back and go, well, hold it. Is, is getting people sober our first priority or is keeping people from dying our first priority because dead people don't recover. Um, and so you can have the best programs in the world to help people get sober, but a lot of them are never gonna make it to those programs. As people get ready to go into treatment, it takes people varying lengths of time before they're willing to go into treatment. And with fentanyl on the street, that those varying lengths of time are lethal. And so we've had to step back and say, okay, what do we need to do now? Let's, let's refocus our efforts on how do we keep people from dying? And we know that methadone and buprenorphine have the benefit of keeping people from dying and other forms of treatment, but there's a lot of people outside that system Mm. who and and it's not unique to Vermont or to this particular uh, disorder. People with all kinds of psychiatric and medical disorders don't immediately jump into treatment. They often have to go through a process of, do I really need to do this? Maybe if I do this, I can manage it myself. And while all that's going on now with a drug like fentanyl, it just takes a tiny error in dosing from getting high to getting dead. Mm. And so this, this issue of what kinds of things can we do for people that will reduce the risk, their risk of death before they actually, or for some people who may never get into treatment, mm -hmm. um, but still that shouldn't be a death sentence. There should be some alternative that we can provide that reduces the risk of death. Certainly syringe exchange helps and naloxone helps. Yeah. All of those things are great, but there's still a hole in the system where people who have not made their way into treatment require some kind of alternative to help them if they're gonna to continue to use, but to help them not die. And that's where these overdose prevention efforts have, have come in, which as you know better than I are being used in Rhode Island and, and in New York, and of course outside the United States have been used for yeah. uh, quite a few years in Vancouver and in Europe they're used and they have data to sh show that they work. And um, we're now starting to see them develop here in the United States. Yeah, and, and, and uh, uh, thank you. And. Um... You know, as you mentioned, you know, I'm, I was brought up in my recovery to be um, abstinence centric. 
that was the, the, the belief system that was handed over to me. It saved my life. And I believe um, deeply in it. And um, in, in the face of the, the velocity of death in America, I've had to expand my thinking. First, I had to move into the acceptance of harm reduction. Had to get rid of all my prejudices about enabling and old coddling and you know not hitting bottom and all this where just perpetuating this drug use. Had to get rid of all that. And then I had to get rid of this idea of, you know, actually, you know, providing a place where people could safely inject, inject drugs. That's very, very far from abstinence. But as a, as a professional, um, uh, and, and even, it even goes deeper than uh, being a professional. I think there's an ethical, um, you know, demand to educate ourselves about this, to look at the science. And as professionals, if we do that, we have to change our view. We have to change our view to match the science. But even deeper than that, Rick, it's, it's a, I'm morally compelled to speak out on this continuously, to try to raise consciousness about this, that to do nothing as a state is to allow further death. And this is completely uh, unacceptable. I'd like, I'd like to... Um, I'd like you to maybe just, can you talk a little bit about the evolution of your thinking? I mean, did you, were yeah. you always in support of overdose prevention sites or has it been a genesis for you? No, I mean, my, I, you know, my training in my, the work I did was always working with treatments that would uh, either promote abstinence or promote a dramatic reduction in use with medications like buprenorphine and methadone. And, um, and I gradually, I became familiar with uh, the, the harm reduction rationale and the idea that abstinence shouldn't be our only metric, our only successful outcome. But if you can reduce people getting HIV, if you can reduce people getting hepatitis, those are good things to be able to do too. Even if those people have not developed total abstinence from drugs, if, if, it's, not, if it's not only good for them, it's good for society because it, it having them get HIV and hepatitis is a very big healthcare cost. Mm -hmm. And so it's, so I, I started to become much more sympathetic to the idea of harm reduction. And, and Ed, you're saying that it, it took you a while to come around. Uh, I sent you a paper, uh, an email by, from the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. That's her first paper mm -hmm. last week where she talks about Harm reduction is something we should be thinking about. And it, that's a big sea change for the National Institute on Drug Abuse because their history had always been sort of treatment, abstinence, drug reduction. Um, harm reduction, we're not so sure about. But in her paper mm -hmm. was the last paragraph was on overdose prevention sites. And for me, even though I got along in, in recognize the value of syringe exchange and um, naloxone distribution and all of that, opioid overdose prevention sites where people go and uh, actually use the drugs under supervised conditions, um, it seemed to me, okay, maybe in the big cities, maybe in Philadelphia and New York City, you, there might be enough people to support or that would need that but Burlington, I don't know if Burlington really needs to have us because those services are not inexpensive to, to, to set up. They have to be supervised. Um, do we really, maybe we can just get everybody into treatment. That was kind of how I was thinking five years ago. Fentanyl comes along, the overdose death rate goes through the roof, even though we've got buprenorphine prescribers throughout the state and methadone clinics, and, and people can get any, the treatment they want, like you said, no waiting list, but we still have all these people dying. Where's the hole? The hole is the fact that there are some people who are gonna continue to use and we need to provide them an alternative. And the data says these overdose prevention sites can do exactly that. If people go to overdose prevention sites, their overdose death risk is dramatically reduced. And um, that's important. That's an important development to, 
to recognize that and to set up something for those folks. Yeah, and, and, and as a scientist, you know, we have to, as professionals, we have to open our minds to that science, which sometimes can, can be difficult. Very well said. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was it was a tough one. I mean, when um, <laughs> Chief Del Pozo yeah. was was still around, and we we would talk about that, he would ask me, and I would go, you know, if Burlington was a million people, mm-hmm. I would be all for it. But with a, the size of the city of Burlington, I just don't know. But there's no question now. I mean, if you look at the data that we see every month at the uh, mayor's meeting that we go to, uh, Comstat. Um, Clearly, the overdose deaths are going up. Uh, every, every month we go in, they're showing an increase over the month last year um, yeah. and double over the year before that. So it's um, certainly the, the case has been made by the data that we need uh, something for these folks. Absolutely. You know, the um, uh, Department of Health and Human Services uh, requested a, a report on overdose prevention sites. And I wanna read just a couple of sentences from the conclusion on the report. So the report was done by the National Institute of Health and the National Institute of uh, Drug Abuse. This is November, 2021. This is in their conclusions and it kind of summarizes, it, it it reflects exactly what you just said. This is the quote, this is from the conclusions. Uh, The preponderance of the evidence suggests these sites are able to provide sterile equipment, overdose reversal, linkage to medical care for addiction, in the virtual abstinence, abstinent, in the in the virtual absence of significant direct risks like increases in drug use, drug sales, or crime. How much clearer can you get? They go on to say, overdose prevention centers may represent a novel way of addressing some of the many challenges presented by the overdose crisis, and they could contribute to reduced morbidity and mortality and improved public health. Then they go on to cite that the, none other than the American Medical Association has also endorsed overdose uh, prevention sites. So, I mean, I don't, when I hear arguments, I hear arguments all the time because I'm sort of in the middle of all this, and I hear arguments from very well-informed, high-level, um, you know, people with power, and and I don't understand how they can still offer what I consider specious arguments against overdose prevention sites. It's just boggling my mind how there seems to be this wall of resistance, in spite of clear unequivocal science, not just any old science, but the National Institute of Health, NIDA, you know, Nora Volkov, uh, people speaking out. It just is, is boggling my mind. And um, it just makes the sense of urgency even uh, you know, stronger as we, as we move forward. You know, when you, when you think about the legislative year and it being over and having to wait to 2023, it just seems like now really is the time uh, for people to, to, to speak out and rally uh, for, for fellow Vermonters with severe uh, substance use disorder. You know, and- um, I, I do think, Ed, that part of what our challenge is, I mean, these numbers of death, these this rate of death increase is really, stunning, uh, like shocking, but it's occurred during the two years of the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, the, the yeah. overlay of fentanyl deaths and the pandemic have been almost right on top of each other. Yeah. And I think there's been, I mean, the Department of Health in the state of Vermont has been swamped with <clears throat> dealing with the, the COVID crisis. And I mean, Poor Dr. Levine, I, I hear him uh, on the radio every day. I mean, it's like he's, he's, uh, his tenure as director of, of health in Vermont has just been, I don't know how he's done it. For, but I mean, I think if it wasn't for all the attention, necessary attention given to the COVID uh, crisis, these numbers of drug 
uh, overdose deaths would probably be getting far more attention because we've never seen anything like it. Yeah. And I think that when once you get people to focus on that and you link, you say, look, we've got a responsibility to try to keep people from dying. These things are all good, but this could also be a way of, of dramatically reducing within some groups death rates. I think it's been hard to get through the noise of the pandemic with, yeah. with uh, these arguments. I, I agree with you, that's, but that's become my, full t- my, my full-time um, intent for 2022. And you know, and, and, and I have a lot of people that are, that are um, in support here. I'll just read you uh, some of the people that signed off on a letter that we sent to the state legislature. Uh, so the, well, I'll tell you where, you know, their organization is the American Civil Liberties Union, City Council of Burlington, the mayor, Mayor Weinberger, um, Physicians, Families and Friends Education Fund. Uh, you're familiar with uh, VAMHAR, the Vermont Alliance for Mental Health and Addiction Recovery. Chittenden County State's Attorney, Sarah George. Uh, United Way of Northwest Vermont, Vermont Addiction Professionals Association. This, this is the association of people on the front line dealing with people with substance use disorder. The Vermont Recovery Advocacy Project, Vermont Recovery Network, Vermonters for Criminal Justice, Spectrum. You know, there are, there's a, a, like a groundswell of support. And you know, Rick, I, I mean, I can't even, you know, you, when you mentioned people in the health department, I mean, I've been at meetings and they're, they're working 60 hours a week. You know, it's just know. incredible what they're doing. They deserve all the credit in the world. And so does Vermont for being a mighty little state, courageous. But it's this last kind of step, you know, this next step of, of overdose prevention sites that we have to take. And, you know, if you look to Rhode Island, the legislature passed in a magnificent, uh, beautiful legislation. Two centers are going to open in March. Um, support statewide from the top down and straight across. No doubt about it. They're going to do it. New York City, um, on point, two overdose prevention sites, both in um, Manhattan, one in East Harlem, one in um, Washington Heights. Now, New York, the legislature didn't do it, but the entire state government and the commissioner of health are behind it 100%. The governor, the mayor, the district attorneys, but for Staten Island, uh, the commissioner of health, the only person who hasn't spoken out in New York is the U.S. Attorney General, um, where there's like silence. Mm. But, but somehow they felt that that silence was enough to invest a lot of money in setting up two sites. So when I, when I look at that, when I look at that, I tell myself that Vermont has to be number three. You know, Rhode Island and New York can be number one and number two, but Vermont has to be number three. And in my way of saying things, in my own naive little, you know, capsule that I'm in, I'm not a big politician, I don't deal with all this kind of stuff, but from my little capsule, we have to do this, and we have to do this this year. This has to happen. It has to happen in Vermont. And, um, you know, with people like you, you know, noted, you know, you, you know, scientists speaking out about this. I had John Kelly on, Recovery Research Institute. He was supportive. I had your colleague, Dan Chikarani on. He was supportive. You know, I've had some, some noted people on the show speaking out with the same, with the same voice, with one voice. Hopefully, um, you know, we'll, we'll make a little bit of a difference in, in getting this to happen, you know, immediately. I certainly yeah. hope. It, I mean, I... If, Fentanyl has been a game changer. It's it's so lethal, and the people who are addicted to it, um, they're at very high risk for death. And and for some of them, a facility like this would would will be the difference between them living and dying. And it and it's that simple. And the question is how how do we where's the, where are we going to put it and how are we going to fund it and let's get going with it because I think we're we're at that point now. We did a heat map. Uh, the city, the the, the mayor's uh, uh, committee did a heat map. We had a heat, heat map done. And um, if you look at it, it's like looking down on the Burlington, Greater Burlington, Chittenden County. If, if you look, if looking down at there's a, like an intense uh, concentration of overdose around Burlington and the surrounding areas. And if you overlay public transportation 
on top of that heat map, map you see all the public uh, transportation lines heading into Burlington. So it looks like it would be uh, Burlington. Mm -hmm. I have it on very good, um, a reliable source um, that, that the number of deaths in, in, in Chittenden County for 2021 is 44 um, with nine pending. So somewhere between 44 and 53 overdose deaths in one county for right. 2021. So, I mean, how much more urgent could it possibly get? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think that it's, I don't think we're, we're at a point now of, should we do this? It's clear that we should do it. It's how do we do it? And yeah. exactly what steps can we get taken in order to make this happen? And I, and I think that's the next, um, challenge is figuring out the steps uh, because I know you had the uh, call with the Rhode Island folks. Mm -hmm. They're more than willing to help and provide yeah. advice and exactly how you do it and how you staff it and what hours you need and all of that. So there is some experience that could be very helpful to, to uh, Vermont in setting up a, a site. It's just a matter now of like, okay, how do we, how do we do it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, I want to I want to thank you uh, for your for your support. I want to thank you for making time once again to to come on the show. You're 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 just the greatest uh, uh, of guests, and um, I'll look forward maybe uh, over the course of the coming year, maybe to have you on again. Maybe we'll talk a little bit more about uh, contingency management and where that's going with uh, stimulant uh, use disorder. I'd yeah. like to see Vermont get get that going too. Because yeah. I think that uh, yeah. other states are doing it. And I think it's Vermont's been a leader. And I think Vermont, because it was invented in Vermont, Vermont <laughs> should be uh, uh, implementing it. I agree with you, Rick. I agree with you. So thank you. And thank you to my the viewing audience for joining us today. And um, we'll see you next month. And, um, you know, stay warm. Thank you. That's right. Thank you, Ed.